what's up y'all it's zach with living corporate and man you know what we do um we center and amplify underrepresented voices in the workplace uh, by having authentic available and frankly incredible conversations with some incredible guests um and you know today is no different right like we've had who we've had robin d'angelo on we've had ruchi katoshian we've had um, we've had professors, we've had executives, we've had um, activists, we've had Dore McKesson, we've had we've all, had all types of folks on the podcast, uh, on the platform. Um, and, and, you know, today is just incredible because we have Michael C. Bush. <laughs> Michael C. Bush is the CEO of Great Place to Work, the global research and analytics firm that produces the annual Fortune 100 best companies to work for list. So, you know, you know, when y'all, you know, when you see companies and they have like the little badge and they'll say, oh, we're like number five, great place to work. This person that we're speaking to is the CEO of Great Place to Work. Y'all, this is a big deal. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to overhype it. I don't think I can overhype it. I'm just trying to give proper context to who we have on the show. Um, you know, the hundred best workplaces for women list, the best workplace for diversity list, and dozens of other distinguished workplace rankings around the world since 2015. Uh, Michael Bush has expanded the Great Place to Work global mission to build a better world by helping organizations create great places to work, not just for the sum but for all. Under his leadership, the firm has developed a higher standard of excellence that accounts for fair and equitable treatment of employees across demographic groups, as well as executive leader effectiveness, innovation, and financial sustainability. His book, A Great Place to Work for All, outlines the compelling business and social benefits that come from these efforts. Michael, first of all, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you, and uh, honored to be with you today. And it's a, it's a pleasure. Now I'm asking, you know, we're uh, we're in the midst of a, a global pandemic. I would I would be remiss if I didn't ask, how are you doing with your family? Is everyone safe and well? Friends and family, loved ones. Thanks for asking. Yeah, the world has really changed in the last 45 days, uh, but I'm doing well. I'm sheltering in place here in Oakland, California, yeah. uh, with family nearby. Uh, so everything's good, and I hope the same for you. You know, everything is good. Um, it's interesting. It's an interesting time. My wife and I just welcomed our um, our first child into the world just a handful of weeks ago. And it's just an interesting time to be new parents, right? Um, with so much chaos, you know, seemingly all around us, so uncertainty around us, but life is beautiful nonetheless. Um, well, congratulations but, to you and your wife. And yeah, you couldn't have brought some, you know, a baby into the world at a crazier time, <laughs> um, you know, but things are always a little bit crazy. And what a story uh, you're, you're going to, you know, be able to share with your baby. And, uh, and we're just going to do what we're always going to do, which is make the world a lot better from here. I love it. Absolutely. Um, so let's get into it. Right, You've been the CEO of Great Place to Work for over five years, going on five years. Can we talk about your first 100 days as the CEO and, and, and like what did that look like? You just kind of stepping into that role and then, you know, in these past five years, I guess part B to the question is what have you been most proud of since taking the helm? Uh, yeah, well, when I stepped into the role in, in 2015, I, I got into the role in a strange way. I was actually hired by the founder of Great Place to Work uh, to sell the company. And I'd done a lot of turnaround work uh, in, in the past. And so I came in and, and worked to do that. And to make a long story short, I ended up getting an investment partner and buying the business. So that that's how I got into it. And then um, one of the things that I knew is that I, I felt like having the analytics of what really was going on for working people and uh, all around the world and knowing that uh, there are a lot of working people who never really get a fair shot at being developed, never get a fair shot at being promoted, uh, never get a fair shot at being recognized and rewarded, um, that I could use, I hoped, the data and the analytics to use recognition to get organizations to change. And so that's really when we made the change, um, almost instantly the great place to work for all. Um, I thought that we, we'd have a platform. And, and at that time, uh, you know, you never know how things are gonna work out. The business was, was technically bankrupt. Uh, so the first 100 days were uh, what you have to do when you're turning around a company that's bankrupt, which is you have to stop all the money flowing out of the company. So a lot of tough decisions, uh, a lot of tough days, uh, where you're just um, uh, pruning the rose bush so that you can grow. Yeah. Um, and, and those times are very difficult, but uh, that's really what the first 100 days were about. <laughs> yeah. uh, not too much about the future, uh, a lot of pain, 
yeah. um, in, in trying to cut costs, um, but uh, we got through it. And so then when you talk about like great place to work for all, like clearly that's a, that's a point of pride for you. And like in kind of continuing to shift and expand um, the platform or the position that you stepped into, can we talk a little bit about what it was about, about that particular, like why you took that angle and like, why was that your point of determined growth for a great place to work? Yeah, uh, Zach, I think the thing that helped me was having a lot of business experience and having been a CEO before, as well as uh, working with CEOs. One of the things that I knew is that most CEOs, while they talk articulately and clearly and passionately about diversity and inclusion, it's not something they think about that much. You know, they, they think about it during Black History Month, you know, or other things uh, like that. But beyond right. it, they really don't think about it that much. Right. Um, so it's kind of a head fake because you can hear these things that are very optimistic and passionate, but in fact, they just don't think about it that much. And so they're, they're CEOs, which means they're thinking about other things like sure. uh, shareholder value, stakeholder value. Yeah. Um, but this one isn't one of them. They delegate it. And so they typically delegate it to a chief of diversity and inclusion or maybe a, a chief of people or a CHRO. Right. Uh, but it's delegated. You know, it's not yeah. something that they lose a lot of time thinking about. And so I knew that and knew a lot of people, you know, doing diversity and inclusion work. And the common experience was if you get to a CEO and you say, hey, I'd like to talk to you about diversity and inclusion. They go, oh, here, talk to my chief of diversity right. and inclusion and I'll see you later. Right. Um, and so they're gone. So. I was trying to find a way of keeping them in the conversation by not bringing up diversity and inclusion. And mm -hmm. we did that. So when you talk about great place to work for all, they don't leave the room because they're like, hey, I'm into that because, um, uh, you know, um, that includes me. Yeah. And um, and also a uh, great place to work for all has superior financial business performance. We've got all the data on that. So now they hang in the room. And now they're there and they're present. And now you have an opportunity to share data and information with them uh, to get them into the conversation and hopefully leading the conversation. So it's really, uh, for me, it was a Trojan horse. Hmm. It was how to get into the castle walls um, and not get, uh, have somebody come out the castle walls, you know, that was delegated right. um, to, to talk about diversity and inclusion. I, I felt that the CEO needed to be in that conversation just like they're in the conversation when they're buying the company. They have a head of M&A, but they're in that conversation. So right. we, I thought that we could make that happen and uh, so far so good. Well, no, it's a great point. And I, I, I you're, it's something that, something that you, just, you just said rung true with me again. I think another example is like HSC, right? Like you talk about health and safety environments, like, like the, the CEO is going to be involved in that conversation by some degree because they recognize the business value and like just the imperative of safety for their workplace. Like they may not be in every single part of the conversation, but they're going to be engaged. Like there are other parts of the organization that that executive leadership that CEOs want to be plugged into. I think it's interesting. It's as much as much growth that um, diversity and inclusion has seen. I think that certain language and buzzwords kind of like trigger disengagement from the senior most people. So I found that really interesting and powerful that you were able to figure out kind of like, I don't want to say the cheat code, but like the way to kind of mitigate that a bit. Yeah, yeah, cheat code, that's not bad. I hadn't thought about it like that, but that's <laughs> kind of what it is. Um, and, and whatever works, you know, kind of by any means necessary. And so uh, we found that this works and it not only works in the US, um, when I first did the For All uh, and started moving it around the world, the mm. first uh, thing we got was resistance because first of all, you're coming from the U.S. Yeah. And, uh, and the racial issues in the U.S., they are on display for everyone to see. And the rest of the world looks at it. And actually, the, but the rest of the world doesn't look at themselves. Yeah. Um, and, and so, but so uh, the first resistance was, well, you're coming from the U.S. We don't have racial issues, uh, which is crazy because it doesn't matter what country you go to, there's racial issues. Right. Um, but they don't, they're not seen the same way. They don't, uh, people don't really self-reflect in the same way. And then, you know, so I was bumping into that. And then what began to happen was people in Sweden started talking about, well, really, you know, women aren't treated fairly. Mm. And so for them, for all meant that. Yeah. Um, and so wherever you were in the world, Japan, you know, women. And so there was always some group of people in 
every country that was treated differently in terms of opportunity and promotion and getting into the C-suite, for example, than others. So then it just took off. Then it just took off. And really, um, outside the U.S., it's been embraced, you know, um, uh, more strongly than inside the U.S. Because in the U.S., you know, people do say, are you using a cheat code? You know, um, <laughs> you know, uh, they're kind of more suspicious. But around the world, the thing is just really taken off. And, you know, the book, um, you know, is now in, I think, 11 different languages and so on, just because of that. Um, yeah. and, and CEOs now want to be linked to a message that um, gets them uh, a lot of brand value. And so great place to work for all gets them a lot of brand value. If they talk too much about diversity and inclusion, you know, they actually get blowback from the dominant group in the workforce. Yeah. Um, and, and so this is a way that they can get out in front and, and be totally, totally inclusive without saying inclusive. It's interesting, too, that like, you know, the amount of work that goes into that, right? How can we be inclusive while at the same time not over signaling to the point where we actually lose the folks in the room who we need to be engaged uh, to create, you know, systemic change and a sense of belonging for everybody? Yeah. Um, you know, that really kind of leads me to my next question. You know, you're the first and let me let me pause here. Yes, you're the first black male CEO um, of a like of a major organization or, or company that we've had on Living Corporate, right? Like so, we've had we've had different like senior leaders and executives and directors, but we, I'm mean, you're the first CEO that we've had. Can we talk a little bit about um, the role that your previous experience? Because you talked about it before about like you were a CEO before this, you 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 had industry experience before coming to Great Place to Work, um, and how your identity plays a role in some of the things that you do and the relationships you have to make and maintain. Um, in your current position? Yeah, I, I think that a lot of times people will ask, like, how did you get to be a CEO? And the answer is, um, I started, um, you know, my own company in 1994. And so it really began by breaking out of corporate America. So it wasn't being within it, it was breaking outside of it. So um, there are other journeys. I'm familiar with them. I have, um, you know, close friends who have done the corporate journey and, and been able to get to the CEO role. That's one path. It's a, it's a very different path than the one that I know the most about, which is the entrepreneurial path. So, um, and, and being the entrepreneur isn't for everybody. Um, just like being a, a corporate CEO isn't for everybody. Um, it takes two different personalities and two different skill sets, really. Um, so, but for me, on the entrepreneurial path, it was... Uh, getting a feeling that I was never going to really be comfortable in the corporate environment. Uh, I was never going to be comfortable. I was always going to be doing some shape shifting um, yeah. in that environment. And so once I broke out, okay, then it was great because I was able to, um, you know, break out and um, uh, do the things that I needed to do uh, to be successful. And, and the thing about, uh, you know, so then how do you grow and, and how do you get to do more? What you got to do is make rich people more money. So it, it's, um, the, the key is that, you know, it, it's you better be delivering that value. And so if you create value for people, you have friends for life. Um, and, and so then you can you start to be able to use that momentum. So all the things that I've done, just like great place to work, you know, what I talk about is profitability. What I talk about is cash flow. So uh, I talk to CEOs about the things that matter to them most. It's all about that. Now, this is the way you do it. But I always go through that door and I've always gone through that door. So yeah. so people know that um, it's about profitability. It's about EBITDA. It's about cash flow. It's about growing market share. And this is the way you do it. The, you know, th this is a way to do it. But yeah. it's, a, it's a business helping another business do a lot more business. Uh, I have the data to prove if you make it a great place to work for all, you're going to crush your competitors. You know, the companies that are on our list that are great places to work for all, outperform the S&P 500, the Russell 2000 and 3000 by a factor of three to one, including today. You know, as the market drops, our companies don't drop as much uh, and they rebound quicker during recovery. So having the data and the analytics, always leading with those numbers, never going to the morally right thing to do, but always being about the business mm. enables the CEO to stay there. So I can actually, the CEO doesn't leave the room because there aren't a lot of DNI people talking about EBITDA earnings and cash flow. They're not. You're right. They're talking about other things. And so I'm not saying that, um, 
you know, there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying, I it's found- It's the reality of the environment, right? It's just the reality of the environment. And, and if you're talking to a CEO about the things they care about, um, uh, which are those financial metrics, you can begin to talk to them about a lot of things because uh, they know they're talking to somebody that everything I say is going to be about enhancing those metrics. You know, I think that that leads me, you know, my, Michael, it's almost like you do this a lot, right? It's almost like you talk to folks and you you do uh, media interviews quite a bit because you just, you help me out. Um, without getting too much into the secret sauce, like we understand that great place to work, like y'all's list is not something that's like qualitative, but it's a variety of quantitative analytics points and measurement. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, the data analytics behind the great place to work rankings has evolved over time and what influenced, if anything, the way that great place to work determines if a company is indeed a great place to work? Yeah. Uh, and so we, we ask the same 60 questions of every company we do business with in 98 countries around the world. So that's one thing that makes us different. Um, other companies kind of tailor the question set. We're like, no, we know people. Uh, we got 30 years of data on people. People, you know, the, the norms might be different. The willingness of a worker to say what they think and what they want they might be more willing and open to it in one country versus another due to social norms. But at the bottom, people want the same thing. Um, and so we measure those things. People want to be respected by the people that they work for. So we ask 11 questions that let us know whether you feel respected or not. People want to work for somebody who they feel is transparent with them. So we ask about nine questions about that. And people want to be treated fairly, more important than anything else. So we ask 14 questions about that. And then people want to enjoy the people that they work with and people want to be proud of their work, which means they feel cared for and they care for the people around them. That's what really drives high performing work is, is people caring about one another. It's not stock options. Those things don't have the stamina right. uh, of people. It, it's, they have to be, feel like they're doing something they couldn't do on their own and be connected by some sense of purpose. So we measure those things. We ask these questions. We're an analytics company. It's all about the numbers. And uh, we do this with 10 million employees and 10,000 companies every year. So across every single industry, there's not an industry that we don't survey in. So therefore, we've got a huge data set to let people know when your people are feeling that in this part of the world, um, uh, things aren't fair. We tell you what that's going to do to EBITDA and profitability and earnings and revenue in that part of the world we can go straight to the, the correlation between the employee experience and revenue and these financial metrics. And in some cases, we can go to causation. We can actually tell you if people aren't feeling emotionally or psychologically or physically safe, those that the, what I just said, um, safety it, it defined in those, in those, uh, with those other three attributes drives earnings. You know, it drives earnings is, is how safe people feel. So we measure those things and therefore can let you know, hey, when we see this set of data, we know these people are updating their LinkedIn profiles. They may still wow. be working for you, but they are looking for the next thing to do. So we call it presenteeism. They're present, but they are looking for a way out. So now the data uh, can be used with artificial intelligence to predict what's going to happen with people. You can see that a person pulls on their, the economy's going good, and a person pulls on their 401k, yeah. and then doesn't return in time not to pay a penalty on that. This person's undergoing some financial pressure, and the financial pressure they're going through affects their employee experience. So we can alert a company that, hey, you got a problem here because we can see this uh, in the data. So it's all about the data. Um, it's all about the 60 questions, and uh, we measure um, the employee experience, how they feel about the people they work with, uh, whether they feel like management involves them in decisions that affect them, whether they trust management, whether they have confidence in management. So we ask a set of questions where we can let a leader know exactly what's going on and then compare that. So we can, if you're a tech company and you get the data, you don't really know what to think. Well, we have a benchmark against other tech companies and then you go, whoa, okay, these companies are actually outperforming me in these areas. I want to do something about it. So 
benchmarking is very important. You can see how Latin America is doing versus South America versus North America, or men versus women, or people of color versus majority, or members of the LGBTQ community versus the majority. You can do all the demographic cuts. The biggest change we made in our methodology since uh, I got involved were these demographic comparisons to see if it was a great place to work for all versus a great place to work for some. That's the revolutionary breakthrough that we've made. And so our lists today are different from the lists in the past because we reward companies that treat everyone the same, where employees are having the same experience and the same in an equitable way, which we're able to measure. You know, you talked a bit about, um, you mentioned like predictive analytics there. And I'm curious how, how far, and if we're here, if we're already here, then let me know. Um, I would, but how far away are we from predicting like lawsuits or like legal action by employees who feel like psychologically, emotionally, physically unsafe, who feel like discriminated against and things of that nature. And like to then present that to organizations and say, Hey, look, you have a serious problem and here's the likelihood of X happening. And then here's the uh, amount of uh, damages that would cost to your brand over X amount of time. Like, do you think that we're anywhere close to that? Or do you think that's anything that would be relevant or pertinent for organizations to have? Uh, well, for some companies, they're able to do it right now. Wow. They're okay. able to do it right now. And this is, you're, 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 you're talking about where we're heading. Okay. Absolutely where we're heading. So if you've got an HR system of record, um, you know, on an Oracle or a Workday or a SAP or, or Ultimate Software, um, if you've got a, a HR system of record, which is a platform that has the payroll information on the employee, the use of benefits on the employee, something around the performance management of the employee, and you have an, an employee engagement tool that's doing the measuring, and those two are nested, and the data can flow between them, you have what you need. Wow. You, you have what you need. And so there are companies who have what they need, and others are heading there now. Now, this is this is the movement to be able to ask an employee a set of questions and predict uh, what's going on with them and the, and what you need to do to um, create a better experience for that employee, which is usually around development and opportunity and promotions and feedback. Uh, that's mainly what most people need and or sometimes tailored benefits around things that are going on in their life, um, like everybody's kind of living through right now. So. This is uh, happening at companies now. I'm very much aware of it. we're involved in it <laughs> okay. Um, okay. by nesting our tool on top of these other platforms. Um, but I would say big companies, Fortune 500 companies, yeah. will be totally in this game in five years, you know, 100%. And then wow. products will be developed for uh, medium-sized companies um, and will be in the marketplace, you know, start to enter in about three years. I just find that so intriguing, right? Like I think about the fact that there's already tools out there that are being mobilized, but then the next half, like within this decade, right? Like we're gonna start seeing. Easily, easily. Yeah, by the end of the decade, this will we won't be talking about this. Um, it, it won't even be a point of discussion. It's gonna be, hey, look, no, yeah. your data says this. This is going to, this is, there's an X percent chance of this happening and we need to make some adjustments now. It's absolutely gonna happen. And so m machines are already now. Uh, at Amazon, machines are, are recommending people for promotion. Uh, machines are recommending people for termination. Wow. Machines are doing that. So they're kind of on the cutting edge. I'm um, not saying that they're doing that um, in a great way. I'm just saying they, they are actually- the, the technology is out there and it's happening. It, it's out there. They're using machine learning uh, tools uh, to make those decisions. So um, others are going to move on that. Uh, and you know, the key is, uh, how do you do those things in a way that employees can trust it? Um, which is a big difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence when there is no trust and a big difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence when there is trust. And if you think about the 60 questions we answer, what are we really, really measuring? It's trust. That's really what we're measuring. Now we can define it in all its dimensions, but it's trust, respect, is a part of trust. Credibility, transparency is a part of trust. Fairness is a part of trust. So trust is really what we're measuring. We could just double click all over it to get you additional information, but it's all about trust. You know, I think, and for me, what I'm, I'm always curious about when it comes to these lists, and I, and I say this to somebody 
of course, I love what y'all are doing. I love Great Place to Work. It's the definitive listening space, right? I think it's also interesting because as a Black man who has a network of a ton of Black and Brown people, right? Like, we'll look at some of these lists and like, dang, okay. Like, I recognize that the overall maybe brand of a company may be really strong and it's it's high up on, it's, it's, it's a number, it's ranked or whatever. But then I wonder like, okay, how do I reconcile that with like stories that I'm hearing from marginalized people who've had like real challenges at these companies. And I'm curious to know, like, where do you see great place to work and great place for all continuing to grow and expand to capture like marginalized voices and experiences? Yeah. So Zachary, you, that's where I was in 2015, exactly where you were, meaning looking at a company at that time, thinking about buying it looking at the list of the places that were ranked as great places to work. And I knew people of color having horrible experiences in those companies. That's why I bought it. <laughs> because I'm like, I can, I think we can do something about this. Yeah. I yeah. think we can do something and we can, we can reorder. And if you look at, at, you know, uh, 2014, 2013, the companies at the top of that list, they're not at the top now. That's true. Yes. Okay. Yes. They're, they're, they're not at the top now. So, yes. so that, that's really what happened. But I was exactly where you were. And so, uh, and definitely driven uh, to do that. And, and so what it has enabled is, um, you know, I'm not satisfied um, by any means. I'm satisfied by the progress, but not by where we are. Got it. Um, yeah. You know, the thing I talk about, the bullseye all the time for me is 2030. Um, that um, that's when we we need need to get this right, which means you know our our analytics are driven by algorithms, and so you've mm. got to continually modify the algorithms. And you modify the algorithm, you got to live with that algorithm and its output for a year. Then you modify it, and you got to mm. live with it for a year. So it, it's yeah. frustrating because it takes a long time. But you know we're at the place now where we can say to a company that hey, um, we've measured the experience of uh different demographic groups yeah people of color and we yeah. can double click on them and so on and yeah. their experience is very different from these other groups therefore you're you're falling down or off the list yeah yeah we can do it on that basis now which that wasn't happening in 2015 yeah there was no no way of doing it we do it now so we call it maximizing human potential that's another cheat code <laughs> uh but what it is is we compare one demographic group to another we reward companies where the gap is is small and we penalize companies where the gap is huge. So you Got can it. no longer be 80% of our people are having a great time. We go into the people who have given a one or a two response on the Likert scale, you know, that are saying, my manager involves me in the decisions that affect me. Never or almost never. Mm, okay. okay, well, we grab that group and compare it and put, we give weight to that, a group that it was never done. The other thing is, you know, in terms of there's other lists out there that are recognizing companies, none of them are surveying employees. So really, those mm. are marketing driven exercises. Right. Those are smiley faces, right? They are. They're, they're just, you know, they're, they're doing something very different. And so um, for us, we can let you know that it, like our diversity list, you know, there's a few diversity lists, you know, kind of out in the world that are are well known. There's only one that measures and scores the experience of underrepresented people. That's a great place to work. Our list is driven by their experience. So it doesn't matter, you know, frankly, what, you know, white males think about their work experience. We don't measure it for those lists. Got it. Okay. We don't, yeah. we don't measure it for those lists. We look at underrepresented people that's what drives that list we look at the, the at their experience because that's what it is um for the 100 best we look at everybody but we don't for that so um it took that's us helpful. a while because yeah. if i had done that immediately i'd be out of business so <laughs> yeah. you, you, gotta build some, you gotta build some brand strength sure. and get people you know to understand what you're doing and that you're you know a rational person who, who wants to grow their business so right. it took some time but yeah. but you know, we're, we're almost there. I don't feel like we're there right now. We're almost there um, where we are just pulling in uh, representation um, into um, our final ranking criterion. So I feel like we're just about there. 
Um, and it's enabling us to have some great conversations with CEOs who love being on our list, but now we're able to say, hey, guess what? Um, even though, you know, we have some companies that, you know, 67% of their workforce are people of color, hospitality companies, and they're having a great experience. Yeah. Which is great. But then we look at the top team and we're like, that doesn't look like them. Right. And, right. and so, but, you know, the good news is you can have that disconnect and a group of people having a great experience. So that's wonderful. But just think how much better they could be. Right. If they could look up and say, hey, if I keep working real hard, it's possible for me to get there. Right. Just think about, I feel respected now, but I really feel respected if that's true. So right. we're able to talk to CEOs and say, I know you're happy now. Nobody in hospitality is happy today. Right. But we know that, days, yes. They were happy. 90 days ago, they were happy. And you could say, look, I know this is great. And I know you're providing a great experience for these people. All these people, that's incredible. We think... Uh, you know, the world of you, but you need to do something about this because you'll really unlock them. And the kind of CEOs we deal with, which are the ones who get how this drives their profitability and earnings. And m most of these have some moral connection as well in sure. the way that they want to be seen and the, the way that they want their families to see them. That's kind of the another lens that hmm. affects the CEO's uh, mindset. Then they go, okay, look, I got it. And they don't have to do it, but they choose to do it. So that's when I know, okay, this is working now. Th this is working now, that that this is enabling them to be who they want to be. And a lot of CEOs, um, I've done a lot of work on, on the following where you have a CEO moving through their career and just having a great career, um, a lot of power, a lot of influence, they're happy and satisfied, and then they have a daughter it changes them forever yeah because then they're like i want my daughter to get paid equal pay right but right. the company they're running it's not happening mm. yeah. all of a sudden they start to look at equal pay differently because they had a daughter i've seen this time and time again yeah a ceo with a daughter ceo with a kid with autism a ceo with a kid with mental health issues it modifies the behavior of that ceo which is great but that shape shifting move blows the door open for being a great place to work for all. Now it becomes their thing. They start saying it because they have this new desire uh, to do something and to change the way that, that others view them and the way that they view themselves. So, you know, uh, first of all, it's been an incredible conversation and, you know, we're coming up on time, Michael, but what I want to do is go back to um, a word that you used earlier, trust. Um, and, and really that, a lot of these questions um, go back to, and the, the rankings and the analytics go back to quantifying trust. I'm, I'm curious to know if you could give us like three points of thought that executives should be thinking about when it comes to building better trust within their organizations, what would those three points be? I think that fairness is the most important. So the way you treat a group of people, whether they be analytics versus non-analytics, accountants versus engineers, you need to treat people the same. People read when you're not doing that. Uh, they are paying attention to whether you're doing that or not. So being consistent in the way you talk to people, uh, respond to people, respond to emails, what you tweet and what you don't, it matters. So fairness is what's most important. And then making sure your actions, if you say that uh, diversity drives innovation, uh, people are gonna look and see if you really think that's true. So if you're saying diversity drives innovation and your executive team is not diverse, then now you lose credibility and you're not being transparent and people think it's not fair. The whole pyramid collapses based on uh, you saying one thing and you're actually doing another. And, um, uh, and then you you want to uh, take a look at your board of directors. You want to take a look at your executive team. You want to take a look at your pipeline and make sure that in 2023, things are going to be different. You want to make sure companies now are restructuring or laying people off. Well, look at the pool that you're laying off. Look at the pool that you're restructuring. If you aren't careful, you're going to erase 10 years of gains in wow. what you're doing right now. So 
uh, these are the things that build trust. These are the things, fairness more important than anything else. The reason there's resistance to DNI efforts is somehow um, wh white men, some feel like money's being taken out of their pockets. Right, the They're scarcity going, mindset, right? Yeah, the, the, the zero sum game. And so you have to, if you have an ERG uh, for African American professionals, Asian American professionals, you need to have one that a white male says, I identify with this one. I identify with this one. They got to have one too. You can't uh, ignore anyone. It has to be for all. Michael, this has been great. Um, I just got to thank you again. Um, before we go, I'll give you a chance. Any shout outs, pardon words, man. I think that entrepreneurism um, is a journey that's not for everybody. If you're thinking about it, explore it. You know, talk to some entrepreneurs and 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 see what it's like. Um, uh, but do an honest check with yourself as to whether or not it, it it's good for you. And then if you're in the corporate environment, lead with the data. The data is what you're going to need. Um, and know that even if you have all the data, if there are people who aren't interested in diversity and inclusion, you know, the data is not going to get it done. So, um, you know, you, you get the data, use the data, make your case with the data. Um, and if you find things are still slow, that's because the leader you're talking to just doesn't want to make a difference. You know, they don't want to change. Mm. And so then I'd update my LinkedIn profile and try and find some place where people were using data in the way that they use it for every other decision, whether it be m &A or anything else. Yes, sir. Um, uh, you don't want anything different in the, in the DNI area. You just want the consistent behavior. Um, but don't bang your head too long or you're going to find yourself with a headache. <laughs> Michael, thank you so much, man. Um, look, we're going to talk to you soon. We consider you a friend of the show. Honored. Pleasure to have you. And uh, stay safe out there. God bless. Okay, thanks. Uh, best to you and congratulations on your newborn. All right. Thank you now. Peace. Okay. Bye-bye. All right, y'all. So that does it for us. This is uh, Ben Zach with Living Corporate. You know what we do. We're having these authentic conversations. Uh, even during the Rona, I pray that everyone is staying safe out there. You know where to check us out. You just Google us. We all over the place. Okay. Living Corporate. Um, you, you, you type that in. We're going to pop up on something. Uh, you make sure you check us out on our website, living-corporate, please say the dash.com or livingcorporate.co, livingcorporate.org, livingcorporate.net, livingcorporate.tv, livingcorporate.us, okay? Livingcorporate. Um, shoot, all the living corporates except livingcorporate.com. We've already talked about this. So if you type in livingcorporate.com, it's going to take you to some Australian website. Uh, prayers for Australia, but we don't have that domain, okay? So livingcorporate.co.us.tv or living-corporate.com. Until next time, y'all, this has been Zach. You've been listening to Michael C. Bush, CEO of Great Place to Work. Catch y'all next time. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.